Okay, everybody, it is three o'clock. So here we are for today's cutting room floor. Um, for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar <laughs> with um, what we do on my social media, uh, Wednesdays, I have what I call cutting room floor. It's just a regular uh, feature. Um, every Wednesday, generally speaking, <laughs> I share um, things that have been cut from manuscripts or um, upcoming projects, or I share historical research, or I answer questions, just a lot of different things. Um, and today, for Cutting Room Floor, I'm going to be doing a live question and answer. I did this, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago, and it was a lot of fun. So I'm coming back to do it again today. Um, last time it was in the evening, so I've moved it into the daytime today because different times work better for different people. Um, so I'm going to be watching the comments off of YouTube and off of Facebook, and I will answer your questions as they come in. Um, as another update, I have been reading um, a chapter at a time every day from a, a story called The Mysteries of London. It was a penny dreadful published in the 1840s, um, and I've been reading that. Uh, because one, penny dreadfuls are a lot of fun because they're way over the top and they're like super exaggerated. Someone in the comments had described it as like a Victorian era soap opera and it really kind of is. So that's been a lot of fun. We're up to chapter 33. If you haven't listened to them yet or just have gotten behind, you can find the playlist on my YouTube channel and I have them on there in order. So you can just click on there and uh, set it to continually play and it'll read like a very poorly produced audiobook. So <laughs> I'm hopping over and join us there. All right, we see a few people who um, are coming in to the stream. So I'm gonna start reading some questions and answering. Um, it says, in the beginning of Friends and Foes, when Sorrel and Philip meet at the end, how does Sorrel get back to the parlor to retrieve her walking stick without the help of her walking stick? Um, she can walk without it, um, not necessarily very well or very fast, but she can. So she would have hobbled her way <laughs> um, around to, um, to find it. So that's how she got there without it. But getting back to her room without it would have been just about impossible because she would have been wiped out by the time she got it back. Um, so there you go. <laughs> it's a good question. I've actually gotten that one before. And I love that people pay enough attention to the little, like, the little details of the stories to have these questions because it makes my heart happy. <laughs> All right, I'm getting a bunch of people saying hi. Um, it's great to have you guys popping in. Lisa is saying thanks for reading the Penny Dreadfuls. Um, yeah, I've been enjoying it too. And hopefully it's bringing a little bit of a bright spot to everyone's lives. I know things are a little bit crazy right now. We're all feeling a little bit confined and have lost a lot of our normal outlets. So hopefully that's bringing people some happiness. Um, Jessica is saying, um, I'm dying. <laughs> I know Lucas and Julia is supposed to come out this fall. Yes, it is actually coming out in September. I announced that uh, maybe a week ago. So yeah, September, yay. Um, but when do you think Charlie's story will be released? Um, I am working on Charlie's story even as we speak. If I can get it done in time, which I should be able to because I'm actually ahead of schedule on it, it should, fingers crossed, be able to come out probably next year. So, yay! Um, Catherine is asking, do you plan to make another story in the world of Ashes on the Moor? At this point, I don't have any plans to, but um, you know, I haven't ruled out the possibility. Um, the 1870s, especially in Yorkshire, was such a rich era with so much going on that there are so many, so many stories that I could tell in that uh, time period, in that era, in that lo location. So I haven't ruled it out, but it's not on my immediate list of things to do. Um, uh, Jana, I am avidly listening to The Mysteries of London. That's the Penny Dreadful that I'm reading. Do you think Richard's and Eliza's storyline will cross? 100% I do. It very, very, very briefly did. Um, in one of the earlier chapters, but I 100% suspect they're not just going to cross again. They're going to converge. I don't know how, but I completely think they will. Um, let's see, another question here from Patricia. The resemblance between the Jonquil brothers has to make remembering character descriptions easier. <laughs> Was that intentional? No, it wasn't. I just loved the idea of them looking so much alike, like just having this unity, not just as like a family unit, but in their uh, connections to each other. There are little things about each other that make them different. You know, um, Philip is the one who always dresses very flamboyantly and Leighton is built on a much bigger scale. Um, 
and you have Corbin, who's very, very quiet. And Jason, you know, being a barrister has that kind of, you know, vibe to him. Stanley is in the army. So he obviously holds himself and acts like a soldier. We have Harold who dresses very somberly and definitely has that aura of respectability. Um, Charlie's one is always getting into scrapes, but we also hear in, I think it's loving Lieutenant Lancaster that Charlie has the tiniest hint of like ginger to his hair. So he looks the tiniest bit different, but overall they're very much the same because I wanted to create a cohesion between all of them. So it has helped, <laughs> but that wasn't the reason for doing it. Um, oh, Trisha says, what inspired an unlikely match? And will you please, 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 please write more about Gwen? Um, an unlikely match is um, the one of my Regency era books that is not part of the same universe as all the others. When I first set out to write an unlikely match, I wanted to write a ghost story. Like that was my intention was just a ghost story. But I realized by the time I got to chapter like three, that what I was writing was a romance and the heroine was a ghost, <laughs> which became a problem. So I set that book aside and started researching Welsh mythology because I wanted to find a way to solve that problem um, that matched something already in, in existence. Like obviously I couldn't solve it realistically, but I wanted to solve it in a way that there was precedence for it. So I spent a few months reading up on Welsh mythology and came upon um, what we refer to as Halloween, but in the um, ancient like Welsh mythological system, that was a day um, that had very significant um, implications in the world of the dead and the world of the living. So I was able to pull that in and fix it. So Tracy, do you know when Kiss of a Stranger might come out in audio? Um, the audio has been made. It was released first to um, Deseret Book um, Plus app. It should show up on Audible any day now. In fact, that's a good reminder. I will actually send um, an email to that publisher and see if they know when um, when that's going to be coming out. Okay, Renee is asking, in Seeking Persephone, why did Adam dislike the prince so much? Um, Adam, for all his grumpiness, is a very giving person when it comes to the vulnerable and the needy. He does not abide things like selfishness and um, unearned confidence <laughs> and arrogance and those who would turn their back on those in need. And the prince was known to be a profligate. He um, he was known to be quite self-centered and arrogant and um, did not look out for the needs of others. And he hated that about him, that he was, he was very false and very, um, I think he would probably describe him as spoiled and that bothers Adam. So that's why he dislikes him. <laughs> Let's see, Hannah, are you ever going to write an update story of Philip and Sora, like a Friends and Foes sequel? Um, we do obviously get to see the all of the Jean Quill families show up in other Jean Quill stories. So to that extent, yes, you will get those. As terms as in terms of any additional stories featuring them as the main characters, I don't know. I'd have to have a really great story idea that made a lot of sense. Um I have had a lot of people ask if I would ever write stories for the next generation of Jean Quills, and that could actually be a ton of fun to see their kids grow up and have their own stories and adventures. But um, that's not uh, currently on the docket, but it's also not out of the realm of possibility. So there you go. Jennifer says, I want Charlie and Artemis to get together, but I also want two more books. <laughs> I get asked a lot um, if I'm going to write stories for the last um uh, siblings in these families and I'm absolutely finishing both series like there's no way <laughs> I'd get to the next to last and be like eh. so yeah they will both definitely get to have stories um okay with the Lancaster and Jonquil books which characters did you create first and did you always know that the series were going to end up combining um the Jonquil series came first it started with well technically with Crispin um, but Philip showing up in that story, I got to know him really well and knew I wanted to tell his story. And as I figured out who he was and who his family was, I realized he had this whole family that we were going to get to meet. 
And in the course of working on that and deciding how that was going to move forward, I decided to write a series um, of regencies based on Greek mythology, which became the Lancaster series. And I was kind of planning them out in my head at the same time. And I have my timelines and my family trees and um, figuring out how they all work. I realized, one, because they exist in the same universe, they would absolutely know each other. And it began to make sense as I filled out all of the people around them that these series were going to overlap in Loving Lieutenant Lancaster. So I have known since the time I was writing um, Seeking Persephone and Friends and Foes that those two series would overlap in Linus's book. So, woo. Jennifer, why do you jump around in different series rather than finishing one? Um, she was just trying to figure out why I would do it that way, not that, you know, she's complaining. Um, in part because um, well, especially with the Lancasters and the John Quills, they overlap at Loving Lieutenant Lancaster. So for that to even work, they have to be coming out congruently like that. Um, part of it has to do with how my brain works, um, what I'm working on when I'm working on it. It's also important from a um, career standpoint <laughs> to not have all your eggs in a single basket at any one time, if that makes sense. You need to have multiple things going at once so that as one wraps up, you have another that's still going and ready to go. So for all of those reasons, hopefully that <laughs> answered your question. Wow, you guys are just flying. So I'm going to try and keep up <laughs> with you. Um, I see Sylvia kind of asked a similar question. What I consider more books about the Jean Quills and Lancasters? Maybe not romances because they're already together. I have thought about it. Whether or not it, I will end up doing it, I don't know. But I have thought about it because um, that could be really, really fun. All right. Um, and again, Sylvia, would you consider having a downstairs romance with some of the Jean Quills servants as the main characters? Um, it's a possible. I have thought about it with some very specific servants. Um, I don't know if I'll end up doing it or not, but I have thought about it. Part of my problem is I have this really long list of stories I've thought about writing. <laughs> and it's a matter of when do I get to them? There are so many. But I haven't. Um, uh, completely uh, tossed aside that possibility. Um, Steph wants to know if Finbar and Fennel, or Poppy, as <laughs> Philip calls them, are going to get their own stories down the road. Yes, I'm planning on it. Um, obviously, those are two different uh, series, but yes, I'm absolutely planning on both of those characters having their own books and their own stories and their own happy endings. So yes, that's on the docket. Um, Maya, or Mia, I'm sorry, I don't know how you can't pronounce your name, is asking, are there good resources you can recommend for researching the Regency time period? Absolutely. In fact, I'll pull them down. So you're going to get a, a few of my shirt here for just a second uh, because my research books are right above my desk. This is riveting YouTube, huh? Okay. I think these are probably the easiest ones to start with because they're a good overview. This one is What Jane Austen Ate and Charles Dickens Knew. It covers most of the 19th century. So it's Regency era and Victorian era, but it's broken down in ways that are fairly easy to understand. It's done by category and it gives some good information. Another good one is George at Hire's Regency World. Um, it's a pretty good resource too. I mean, I have tons of other ones <laughs> up here, but those are two really good ones. Another one that I have is called An Elegant Madness. Um, and it covers this era, but I feel like it is one I would go to after having covered some of the basics in books like these. So there you go. Okay, Jana wants to know, will there be another book in the Savage Wells series? Yes. Um, nothing like official, 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 but yeah, there will be. Um, the next one will be for Hawk, the um, U.S. Marshal. He'll have the next book in that series. So um, let's see. If I have missed any others, because there's just been so many. <laughs> All right. Okay, here's one from Leslie. I love that every book I've read of yours has at least one character with a physical or mental disability, and they're generally treated like actual people rather than just their disability. How do you approach writing disability as part of characters? What kind of research do you do? Well, one of the reasons you're going to see that and you'll continue to see that is because I um, am a d disabled woman. So I that's part of my life. It's part of my experience. I'm what's called an ambulatory wheelchair user, which means I can 
walk, but not always. And so um, I'm in and out of my chair fairly often. Um, one of the projects we had going on at the very end of last year was uh, building a wheelchair ramp onto the back of my house because I'm in my chair more often than I used to be. Um, I have a degenerative disease that obviously is impacting that, but down the road will mean I'll lose the use of a, a lot of my body. So something that I experience all the time, it's something that's part of my existence. And, um, I f have found as I've read other fiction, it's so hard to find books that portray, um, people with disabilities, people with chronic illnesses, people with mental illnesses, um, in ways that are not only accurate, but also portray them as human beings first and foremost. Um, so often the disability is used as a catalyst to convince the able-bodied characters to do good things with their life or um, that character is there in order for us to feel sorry for them or you know things like that. And it was just so hard to never see myself in a story, to see someone like me portrayed in a way that makes it clear that they're worthy of love, that they are loved by people, that they accomplish amazing things, that they um, are human beings and their lives have value. It's something we don't see often enough. And um, at first this was, I didn't even catch on to the fact that this was such a huge part of the books that I was writing because it's just part of my life. And so to me, it makes perfect sense that um, disabled um, individuals should be part of stories because they're part of life. Um, but once I realized it was there, I recognized the importance of it for me, but also for others who are in similar situations. So that's something you'll continue to see in my books because it's something that's important to me. So um, yeah, and what kind of research do I do? Obviously not every disability is the same. Um, my experience with disability is not going to mirror that of someone else with a different disability. So um, I do a lot of research into that disability in the era my book takes place in because it would be treated very differently at the time um, I also talked to, um, I set a goal of at least a half a dozen people who either have themselves experienced that disability or someone in their immediate family, or perhaps they are a physician who works with individuals with that so that I can make sure I am accurately portraying an experience with that. Um, also there's the recognition that even two people with the same disability aren't going to experience it in the same way. And so what I'm trying to write is an experience with it that reflects reality, knowing that not every person's experience will be identical. So um, lots of research, lots of talking to people, um, just wanting to get it as close to accurate and right as I can get it. Um, that was a long answer, but it was a great question. So thank you. Um, Julie is asking, I was wondering if Adam will eventually realize Philip is a spy. I've wanted those two to become friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if Adam will ever figure that out because Philip has already kind of, he's retired from that. And so he is slowly distancing himself from it more and more so that the things he did in the past won't, um, catch up with him. Does that make sense? So I don't know if Adam ever will. It would be interesting. <laughs> no, I guess, can you see my brain spinning? It'd be interesting to see what he would think of of that. Anyway, now you got my brain going. Okay, I gotta focus on the question and answer. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's see what I have forgotten. Uh, Kimberly is asking, "Will Lord Devereaux get a second chance at love?" Um, I do know what his next story, his next book would be. I haven't written it yet, but I do know what it is. And um, I hope to be able to write it because I love that character. Um, I would love to be able to show you how he has grown since we knew him in Glimmer of Hope. We see bits of that in For Love or Honor, but I'd love for you to be able to just spend time with him again. I mean, obviously he's not perfect. None of my characters are ever going to be, but he has improved significantly. So that'd be fun to revisit him and see how he grew and changed. Um, why are most of the women short in your stories? Would it be possible to have taller women? Um, part of the difficulty there is for the most part, women in the eras I write in were short. They just were like, it's kind of the way it is. What you're also getting is a, um, a comparative height. Uh, when you look at the men in my stories, you have the Jean Quo brothers who are exceptionally tall. So every woman they interact with is going to seem short compared to them. Most of my women are actually average height. Uh, Mariposa is very short. She's one of the few that is like really quite short. 
Um, but it's really the issue is that it's comparative and it's the constraints of the era. I do have a book coming up down the road featuring a character of a woman who is noted to be quite tall. Um, by modern standards, she probably wouldn't be considered tall, but at the time she was. So yes, there. it's not so much that the women are short, it's that the men are tall. <laughs> and the women of this era weren't as tall as what we have now. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, all right. Uh, Kelly wants to know, do you have all your characters mapped out before you write a book or have you added a character as you've been writing? I don't know that I've ever added a character. Sometimes my characters adjust and shift a little bit. Maybe a character I thought was going to be a real minor character um, turns out to be more significant, but I don't think I've ever actually added one in after the fact. I do a ton of pre-writing work. So generally by the time I sit down to, um, to write a story, I already know tons of what's going to happen. So I can't say I've ever added one in as I've written, but they have changed as I've written. Um, let's see. Sylvia says, I loved the book of your novellas, The British Isles Collection. Does your that publisher plan to release other novels, novellas under one cover? I think if I had the time to sit down and write a couple of new ones, because we try to at least make sure there are a couple new novellas when we release a collection. If I were to sit down and get that done, then yeah, I think we would do it in a heartbeat, but it's a matter of <laughs> having the time to write extra stuff. Right now I haven't really had that. Oh, Jolene's on here. She says she loves my hair, thanks. <laughs> this is my quarantine hairdo has kind of defaulted to pigtails because <laughs> it needs to be cut. <laughs> this is the easiest thing to do with it while it's at this weird length. Um, I'm getting a lot of people saying they love that I represent disabilities in my work. I appreciate that. There is a lot of pushback with um, disabled characters or chronically ill characters and it's always nice to hear from people who appreciate that they're there. We get pushback in real life so to also get pushback when um, we are portrayed humanly and empathetically and correctly in fiction is hard. So it's nice when people appreciate that. Um, let's see. I keep thinking I probably missed some because they swing by so fast. Um, Okay, not so far. So I'm going to answer a different question that I got over on, I want to say it was Facebook. Let me pull that up. Um, and put in questions in the comments on YouTube and on Facebook. They both pop up here where I can see them and can answer them. And <laughs> my internet's like, no, you're not allowed to pull up anything else that's on here. Um, it's going to come. All right, there we go. This is from Amy. She said, since people tended to speak a little differently in the time periods you write in, how do you write in a way that flows well for readers yet keeps the authenticity of the time period? to make it seem as if the characters are speaking in their own time, which is an excellent question. Um, a lot of people have asked me or have commented on how I write like, you know, it's true to the era, but I actually don't. Um, my writing is very, very modern. You'll know that if you go back and read Dickens, if you go back and read Bronte, if you go back and read Austen, um, that what I write actually is very modernized. Um, what I tend to do is pop in instances of older sentence structure, and I sprinkle it with words and phrases from the era. So it gives you the impression of the time period without making you actually slog through the wording of the time period. So that's really, I think, what it comes down to is sentence structure and grammar and uh, the occasional use of a phrase or a word from the time period. It reminds the reader of what time period they're in without actually making them transport to it. So that was an excellent question. It's it's seasoning <laughs> your writing without overwhelming it. Um, let's see, I gotta swing back. Tiffany says, who pushes back about disabled characters, readers or publishers? Um, you get it from both. Um, I know one of the one of the biggest pushbacks I got in Glimmer of Hope was a lot of people insisting that a woman with a chronic um eventually fatal illness 
was a bad choice in heroin in a love story because no one wants to read about someone whose life is not going to be a long one. There was lots of that, that that isn't, you know, doesn't really count as a love story, which of course is hard to hear when you yourself have a disease that will cut your life short and debilitate you as you move forward. Because I know it's not true. I, mean, I have a great love story and um, it's, yeah, that's kind of what you hear. And I know, I think most of the pushback that writers get from publishers is worry from publishers that readers won't want to read about disabled characters. So we end up having to keep fighting that fight to make sure that um, people like us don't get erased from fiction. So yeah, it happens. Um, Ashley wants to know how many books do you work on at the same time and does it ever get confusing? <laughs> it gets very confusing. Um, between outlining and editing, I usually have anywhere from four to six um, projects going at the same time. Some are being drafted, some are being outlined, some are being edited. Um, they're all over the place. And yes, they get very confusing. Um, I take lots and lots of notes. I keep notebooks of information about books that help me keep it straight. But there are times when I'm so confused. I think the hardest thing is the voice. Like I will jump from a Hope Springs book, which is um, mid 19th century American West amongst a group of immigrants to um, a Regency, which is early 19th century aristocratic fancy England. And the way they talk is so incredibly different that I'll find myself using the wrong style of language <laughs> in the different books. So that can get very, very confusing. Um, all right, let's see. Claudette wants to know, are you reading anything just for fun that has nothing to do with research or any of your projects? Um, depends on how you define fun. <laughs> because I think research is fun. There's a lot of my um, reading that I do into time periods, which I know the reading will be helpful eventually, but I'm actually reading it because I like it. <laughs> I have this really, really thick book about... Um, clothing of the Regency era that I've been reading for quite a while now. And it's just fascinating. It, it is helpful and it is research, but at the same time, um, it it's fun. <laughs> so that's kind of what I've been working on. Um, let's see, Monica is asking, do you like writing Mrs. Bauer and her daughter since they have popped up here and there in different books or do you just like to irritate us? <laughs> it's not so much that I like them, but that there are people like that. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're there and they're just part of having to navigate society. They keep popping up because um, the, the, the tone, the you know, high society was such a small group of people that they all would have known each other and crossed paths all the time. So that's why they come up very, very frequently because they would have, they just would have been everywhere. Um, Rebecca says, I've heard you mention different time periods. Um, Regency, Victorian, Edwardian. Can you explain them in what order they go in? You bet. First, um, of the time periods I write in, we have the Georgian era, which is the 1700s. That's what it was called in England was the Georgian era. Um, this is toward the end of this. We have the American Revolution, the French Revolution. Um, Hamilton, the musical, takes place in the Georgian era, although it's in America, so it's not called that. Um, then we have the Regency era, which is approximately the first 20 years of the 1800s. Um, and it's called that because during that time period, during a portion of it, the country was being run by a regent or someone who ruled in the stead of the king. Um, after that, we actually have a transitional era, but that drops us into the Victorian era, which is um, the last six-ish decades of the 19th century. It's called that because Queen Victoria's reign was during that era. That takes us basically to the end of the 1800s. And then as we transition from the 1800s into the early 1900s, we have the Edwardian era. And it's called that because King Edward reigned during that time period. Um, of course, these are the names of the eras in England. They're called different things in different areas of the world. So hopefully that is helpful. <laughs> it's very quick and very, but that's um, basically the order they go in when they take place. Anna is saying, how's your foot doing? <laughs> How are you surviving quarantine? Um, many people who've hung out on my social media long enough know that I had um, uh, yet another surgery on one of my feet at the beginning of the year. I have an issue with it that we're trying to fix, but it's a very, very complicated one to fix and it doesn't always work super well. Um, because of all of this um, sheltering in place that we're doing and because I have um, severe, I'm severely immune compromised. So I have to be very, very careful in times like this. 
I haven't been able to go to physical therapy for a month now. So my foot is healing very slowly. They have me doing some things at home that's helping, but it's obviously not healing as well as we'd like. What that will mean in the long run, I don't know yet, but hopefully. <laughs> How am I surviving? Um, I'm at the point where I'm allowed to um, leave this room. <laughs> I was confined to this room for about three weeks because I was getting over a really horrible um, lung infection. Um, so I'm allowed to explore the rest of my house, but I'm going a little stir crazy. I'd love to be able to go somewhere <laughs> other than right here. Um, let's see, Amanda is saying, where do you go to do your research? How long do you spend researching? How do you know it's legit? Um, I have a degree in research. And so the question of how do you know it's legit, that's like three semesters of classes. <laughs> um, the ability to um, evaluate sources is a huge um, aspect of being a researcher. Um, Generally speaking, people will say primary sources are your best source, but primary sources also tended to be things like journals and letters, and those weren't always truthful. <laughs> um, you need to find the same information in multiple sources. Those sources need to have credentials, so people whose degrees are in that area, museums that specialize in that area, archives that specialize in that area, needs to be confirmed in multiple places. Um, uh, how long do I spend researching? A lot, a lot. Um, probably only 10% of what I research even makes it into a book. So you can imagine how much time it takes. When I'm getting ready to start writing in a new um, time period, I spend two to three years studying that time period before I start writing in it. So a lot of time. <laughs> oh. Um, Tiffany is asking, does the book I'm reading explain the transition of clothing styles between eras? Um, the book I'm reading is focusing exclusively on the Regency era, so it doesn't talk about the, um, the transition or the slide between eras. Um, I've actually done a few presentations on that because I think it's really fascinating. Um, the way you can watch, if you look at it, clothing styles slide and adjust into new looks over time and, and the way the silhouettes change and grow and widen and lengthen. And, um, and when you understand the eras in which people wore those clothing, you recognize the impact of society and worldviews and politics and other things on how people dressed. It's really, really, really fascinating. Um... Okay, let's see if I've missed any others. Riveting, right? Okay. Oh, and um, Steph is talking about how she enjoyed uh, Cecily and Finbar and how we get to see them learning to navigate a, the world as um, disabled individuals. Um, in a world that's not designed for people with disabilities. Um, that I think is one of the, the things I find myself very passionate about writing about because um, ours isn't a world or a society that's designed to be um, fully lived in by people unless they are able-bodied and unless they are you know, mentally very you know whole and healthy and so many of us aren't. And so it's such an interesting thing to step back and realize the ways in which we don't even recognize that we are leaving people out of um, our shared experience simply by not opening our eyes to the ways in which they are prevented from participating. So there you go. <laughs> oh, Hannah is asking, so this has nothing to do with Regency or writing topics, but did you feel the earthquake we had here in Utah last month? Uh, yeah, we did. Um, I'm not super, super close to the epicenter, but close enough. And I 100% felt it. it. Took me about a split second. I went from what's that to, oh my gosh, earthquake. <laughs> so yeah, definitely felt it. We felt um, quite a number of the aftershocks too, which I've been surprised by. Cause like I said, we aren't super close to the epicenter. We didn't have any damage here around the house, which is nice, but it definitely um, was a little disconcerting. There was another one, was it yesterday? I think it was, or the day before or so. Yeah, they just, they don't want to stop. Um, Tiffany is saying, can you explain how and when men's pants changed? For love and honor brought up the requirement to wear pantaloons or something. Um, in the Georgian era, I mentioned that a little while ago, that's 1700s, men um, wore knee breeches. So um, the pantaloons that uh, buttoned or buckled right at the knees, and then they'd wear silk stockings with it. Um, as we transition into toward the mid 
Regency era, we start to see men wearing um, trousers, long pants, pants that went to their ankles that didn't fit quite as tight. Um, but for more formal occasions being presented uh, at court or at all max or at some of the um, more formal balls, the men would still revert back to knee breaches because it was considered the formal wear of the time. It'd be like if nowadays you got an invitation to a black tie event, you wouldn't show up in a blazer and a guy wouldn't show up in a blazer and khakis. Um, it was kind of a similar idea. So that sort of happened slowly. As we transition into the Victorian era, men stop wearing the knee breeches altogether. So there you go. Um, Natalie says it might be hard to answer without spoilers, but when you first started writing Longing for Home, did you already know who Katie would end up with? I didn't. Um, I didn't know who she was going to end up with until halfway through um, writing Hope Springs. Uh, I was actually writing two different versions simultaneously, one with each guy being the one she ended up with in the end. And about halfway through realized that the guy she doesn't end up with, that version of the story where she does was feeling forced. I was having to manipulate it too much to make it work. So I knew which direction it had to go. Liz is asking, where's the dog? <laughs> He's right there. He's snoring. I don't know if you can hear him. <laughs> He's always here. Oh. Okay, Valerie says, yes, the, the most recent earthquake was last night. I thought I remembered it was last night. Um, Rebecca's asking, will they release the audiobook of Kiss of a Stranger to Audible? Yes. In fact, I'm kind of surprised it hasn't happened yet. I'm going to send an email to that publisher and see if I can get an estimated um, day for the three that they did last year to switch over to Audible. Um, Mia or Maya wants to know, when do you know a book is fully ready for the public? I don't think any author ever feels like a book is totally ready. It, it, there's always that feeling of, I could be doing more. I could be doing extra things. What if I've missed something? If there's something I didn't get right? I heard a saying once, um, a book is never finished. It's just abandoned. <laughs> That's kind of the way it feels. You reach a point where you know that, yeah, maybe you could keep fiddling with it. Maybe you could keep making adjustments, but it's good, good enough. And you have to get to that point where you'd never finish. You would just, you'd spend all your time constantly rewriting. I think one way I know I've done as much editing as I possibly can is when I absolutely hate the book. <laughs> it sounds bad, right? But by the end of that really deep, intense editing, you're just like, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. I'm done. I'm finished. My brain cannot possibly focus on this book anymore. And that's usually a good sign that it's ready to move on and you can work on something different. All right. Okay, I know I missed one that was earlier, so I'm going to swing back. Valerie wants to know, could you do a slideshow or something to show the clothing style changes? Um, I had to see if there's a way to do the presentation I've done before talking about the clothing styles changing over the 19th century. Um, there's lots of slides and stuff, but I bet if I played around with it, I could find a way. That could make for a really fun um, just presentation at some point, so. Let me look into that and see what I can um, work out. All right. Okay, guys, I think I've caught up with your questions. So uh, unless you pop more in here, we may wrap this up for today. Okay. Well, I don't see any others. Um, if you can think of any in the next couple of minutes, I will answer them as they come in. But this was fun. Hopefully you got some questions answered, learned a few things. You got to hear me wax long and <laughs> passionate about uh, disability representation in fiction. That's something else that I feel really strongly about and uh, something you'll continue to see in most of my books because I think it's such a huge part of, of the lives of so many people and it gets overlooked or misrepresented or portrayed in ways that aren't um, empathetic in the way it ought to be. So that will continue to be in there. Um, I am working on new stuff even as we speak. Uh, hopefully that'll all stay on track and get done in time, even with the craziness that's going on. But uh, two more releases by the end of the year. We'll keep doing uh, live videos. I've had people ask if I'll do more tea with friends. I need to send out some uh, emails and see who I can get to join me. But We'll keep going. Keep tuning in for Mysteries of London every day. And uh, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.